so much for coming. I really, really, really appreciate it that shows a tremendous level of dedication to science and quantum to come in this weather. That really means a lot. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is our first meeting. We will have more and more meetings. It's not going to be the last. Hopefully, we will find you know, other speakers, specialists here. We are at the heart of Quantum Valley. IQC is here. We will have speakers and we will have more events. Tonight, Dr. Suter from IBNQ is going to tell us about you know, the cutting edge where quantum computation and this technology is going. And then we will have some panel discussions with Dr. Roger Melko, who braved the cold weather team, and Dr. Peter Vitek. Uh, I will tell you about their bio a little bit. So Dr. Suter is Vice President of IBM Q. Uh, he's the Vice President of IBM Q Strategy and Ecosystem at IBM Q Research. He's responsible for IBM Q Program Leadership for Quantum Computing and Education, Intellectual Property, Analyst Relation, and Cross Business Unit Offering Integration, the IBM Q Network, and the ISP Partner Ecosystem. Okay, I don't know lots of these things, so he's going to tell us what, what these terms mean. So, Dr. Suter has been with IBM for 35 years, more than 20 years with IBM research. His degrees are from Harvard and Princeton, and both in mathematics. So, Dr. Roger Melko, uh, he's a professor at the University of Waterloo, whose research interest involves strongly correlated many-body systems. He will tell us what that means. We focus on emergent phenomena, ground state phases, and phase transition, quantum criticality, and entanglement. Good stuff. And then Dr. Peter Wittig, he's the quantum machine learning expert. There's one quantum machine learning book that I know of, and he's the author. So we are so lucky to have him here tonight, if you're interested in quantum machine learning, you can go talk to him, ask for his email. So he's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and the academic director of the quantum machine learning program at the Creative Destruction Lab. That's where I started actually my entrepreneurship journey. So I didn't do machine learning. Uh, and he's affiliated with the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence and the Perimeter Institute here in Waterloo. He obtained his PhD from National University of Singapore and his research explored the synergies between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and quantum information theory and quantum computing. All the good stuff. Okay, thank you so much. And we will start as soon as Dr. Suter. There he is. Please. start with a math question, which is, how long does it take to get Hamilton to Kitchener at 20 kilometers an hour? <laughs> they need quantum computer to calculate that. <coughs> Two hours? You need a quantum computer to predict more accurately the weather, so we know two months ahead. November 15th is not the best time. All right, thanks. All right, so, so first of all, very sorry about being late. Um, I actually did allow quite a bit of extra time. I live in western New York, a little bit south of Rochester, so you know, the, the snow isn't foreign to me. Um, usually, in fact, you send it across the area to us, so I'm very familiar with it. Um, but for some reason, I, I was thinking that it would be more eerie, but just as I came further and further to Canada, the capital is so here I am. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about quantum computing, and I, I do certainly appreciate I'm late, so I'm going to do a little editing of the slides in real time, just so we don't keep you all night. Uh, I'm glad you've got something to eat. Uh, so uh, I'm part of the IBM Q program. Uh, a little bit about my, my background. I'm a mathematician um, by training. Uh, I've done a lot of computer science. But 
most specifically, I am not a physicist. Okay? And so I hang out with some physicists and I can answer some questions, but I'm really not a physicist. Okay? And, um, and that's okay, because in, in fact, a lot about quantum computing, uh, because of course it starts with quantum mechanics, um, began with physics and a lot of the early people who were doing quantum computing were, were physicists. And while there have been very famous mathematicians like Peter Shore who have been involved through the years, right, quantum information scientists as well, uh, frankly, if you look at a lot of the code that had been written for quantum computing, it was written by physicists, uh, bless their hearts, versus computer scientists. <laughs> so over the last few years, there's been a lot more that's been done on the software side of things, where we have brought in mathematicians, applied mathematicians, computer scientists, and so forth. Uh, this is a photograph of a 50 qubit model. Uh, it tends to travel the world. Uh, we bring it to trade shows, and it's, it's a very good way of making quantum computing tangible. One of the problems with a lot of technology, right? So first of all, um, quantum mechanics is scary to 99.99% of the entire world. Okay? So, um, Sorry, but their eyes glaze over as well as with many, many others of the topics. Uh, but that's also true of a lot of software, right? And so if you talk about uh, many of the, the inner parts of the web and so forth, the blockchain, people have no idea what you're talking about. They can't pick it up. They can't touch it. It is not tangible. So one of the things about quantum computing, one of the main reasons why we around with us is to give something to people that they can start to say, ah, okay, so what's really involved with quantum? And we talk about the electronics, we talk about the refrigeration. A little closer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Omnidirectional. That way. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, so let's let's kind of jump into this and we're gonna go back now to 1981. And there was a conference hosted outside Boston, Massachusetts by MIT and IBM. And there are a whole bunch of uh, pretty famous uh, physicists in, in this photo. Um, and they asked very fundamental questions about the limits of computation as it related to physics. So I have discovered in talking about quantum computers that uh, when people look at, for example, smartphones, tablets, laptops, servers, those are computers, and those are the only types of computers. And anything you would ever do with a thing that is a computer, you would do on something like that. Versus, that's a particular type of computer. Right? And so they ask questions in that regard, of the, the so-called von Neumann machines that go back, the architecture that goes back to the 1940s, saying, are there limits? Are there some things that we will never be able to effectively compute? And, you know, that's not that unreasonable question. I mean, there have been a lot of uh, mathematical work in the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, Gödel's theory about uh, mathematics being, you know, that there are true theorems that nevertheless you cannot prove to be true. So this is, in some sense, when you look at information theory, are there things that one should be able to compute, yet with this particular that of architecture, you could not. Uh, and even if you don't want to get to the point of saying totally impossible, let's say impractical. All right? And um, so Richard Feynman, uh, who is here, he's, uh, he's right there, probably the most photographed physicist in the world, um, maybe other than Einstein, um, and that's largely his doing. He showed up in a lot of photographs. Uh, many of the stories about him, he made up himself. Um, right? <laughs> Bear that in mind in your career, right? You want a reputation, maybe. Uh, during this, and, and, and particularly in the paper that he wrote after the uh, conference, he said, I'm not happy with all the analyses that go with just the classical theory. So here too, for the computers you have, the laptops, so forth, um, these are now classical. So he's not happy with the analyses of what you can do with classical computers because, and he put this in a paper, so the next paper you write, you know, 
give it a little bit more emphasis by saying, because nature isn't classical, damn it, right? And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by simulation, we mean here, how do you represent something essentially exactly in a computer? Not approximately, exactly. And what are the limits? And what's the difference between approximate computing versus exact computing? Right? Now, you can ask the other question, which is, why do I care? <laughs> is approximate good enough? But Let's put that aside in terms of uh, uh, the, the intellectual question. And, and so I'll, I'll give you the standard example I give, which is this, which is about caffeine, and there's our IBM thing, coffee cup, right? So, if we ask to describe a molecule, so let's write down a molecule, and I chose caffeine because I, I, I speak many places around the world, and everybody knows what caffeine is, right? There are many, I mean, they know what water is, right? And then caffeine is often number two here. But if you were to ask someone to say, if you were to write down absolutely all the information you would need to reproduce a caffeine molecule exactly in a computer, what's the scale? What's the magnitude of that information? And so, you know, if you ask a layperson as a non-scientific person, you would say, is it a megabyte? Is it a gigabyte? Right? Now, just how much information is there really so that you could essentially reconstitute everything that would be known about that molecule? And so just looking at the energy configuration of this, the amount of information you need in bits is roughly on the order of 10 to the 48, so 1 to the 48 zeros. And to put that in comparison, the number of atoms in the Earth are between 10 to the 49th and 10 to the 50th. So worst case, the number of bits you would need to represent the ground state energy of a single caffeine molecule at a single instant could be comparable to 10% of the number of atoms in the Earth. That's not going to happen. Now, Waterloo is known for great technology, but I don't think you're developing storage that is quite that large. Nor will you, right? Now, what I haven't said, though, bear this in mind, um, is how we actually get that information and how we actually write it down. So what we will talk a little bit about, of course, is quantum computing and quantum bits, qubits. And you could store all that information that we're talking about, the 10 to the 40 bits, in 160 working qubits. That is, qubits that are actually operational. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm not saying anything about how you would get that information into those 160 qubits. And I'm not saying what do you do then, and how many qubits do you need, and how much time do you have. All we're talking about is a memory story, right, for, for representing this information. And then just in comparison for a few other molecules of interest, um, the number of classical bits you would need for water, 10,000, you could fit that into 14 qubits going all the way down to common sugar, which is sucrose, 10 to the 82nd classical bits, 274 qubits, and then penicillin, again, because if we're talking chemistry, invariably, drug discovery comes up. And so if we're going to make any sort of claims about what we hope to do with quantum computing, drug discovery is always a good thing to do. Right? Um, and of course, it, it would be, um, excellent area to work. But you're going to need, even for penicillin, 286 qubits. The largest quantum computer we have is a 50 qubit machine. Now, other people claim to have other larger, slightly larger computers. Let me tell you that whether you have 20 or 50 or 72 or 128, it doesn't make very much difference. It's not the order of magnitude of the Having 20 really good qubits is much better than having 2,000 really lousy qubits. High error rates, low coherence times, and things like this. So this is the first but not the last time I'm going to mention is do not get hung up simply on the number of qubits. 
and we're spending a lot of time educating the media, so if anyone walks in and says, look at my wonderful 36 cubic machine, you will get the question saying, ah, well, what's the volume of your cubits? Can you tell me the quantum volume of your cubits? What are your error rates? What's your T1 time? If you're not prepared to answer that, then who cares? To be honest with you. All right, so we're going to return to these numbers uh, a little bit later. And so as you might expect, because of, of that lead-in, chemistry is an area that people are starting to, to look at. Um, and there, there are many startups that, that are doing this. We think that material design, material sciences, will be the first area. The chemical structures are simplest. Uh, it, it's well understood. Uh, it's also a profitable area to get into everything from soap up to alloys being stable in aerospace. Right? Um, oil and gas, um, new, new catalytic processes, and as I said, drug discovery. To give you an idea of the timeline, though, we're probably really not doing anything but serious drug discovery for 10 or 15 years, just until the machines can get powerful enough. Enough good cubes. AI, well, this is an interesting area. Um, quantum computers are not big data machines. So when you know a bit about quantum computing and you, when you read popular articles, you can start picking out the standard mistakes. Problems that are so big that require billions of records will be done really fast on a quantum computer. No, they won't. <laughs> OK, because quantum computers Computers cannot pump data through themselves very fast. There is no notion today of quantum memory. So literally, loading data is, we start with all the qubits being zero, and then we turn and make some of them one. And if you go back to the 1940s and you look at those old machines, they had little switches. And they were all zero if the switches were down, and then you'd flip a couple up, and then you'd have a computer, right? Now you just do this in a slightly more sophisticated way. So any statement you see about AI and quantum that is in the short term that involves a tremendous amount of data is not happening. Now, you can't talk about the size of the inputs. So you may start with a lot of data, right? And then you may reduce it somehow, right? You may sketch it, that's a common technique, in some way to reduce it to smaller data, lower rank, things like this, so forth and so forth. Fundamentally, it's not an AI issue. Okay, but there may be some calculations we can improve and we can do better, right? Uh, quantum computers um, are typically very good linear algebra machines. So are there down deep the lowest level of machine learning at the levels of deep learning, some things we can do to speed up those algorithms. And even earlier this week, there was some discussion, there was a new paper out of MIT about low rank matrices and inversion, and everyone thought you need quantum computers, and it turns out that no, you actually don't. So there's always going to be this interplay between classical and quantum algorithms. Um, so that's one thing with AI, that is make what we do now faster. And the other thing is to say, well, are there entirely new algorithms by using the properties such as entanglement, right, among qubits, to that may correspond to certain patterns and some data to do, let's say, classification at much higher accuracy. That is promising among some of the other areas. And then financial services. Um, if you are in the business, <laughs> well, if you are in a business, if you're thinking of doing a startup. Uh, Good to sell to banks. Banks have a lot of money. <laughs> okay, but also the investment side of the house, the hedge funds and all those sorts of things. Right? If they drop $10 million to something that's really significant and improves something by a few milliseconds, they will make that back in a few years. So working with them, and therefore there's a lot of interest in working with them. Um, but there are areas like asset pricing, risk analysis, rare event simulation, Replacement of classical Monte Carlo methods by something that may be faster, as much as quadratically faster, and so forth. Uh, this rare event simulation notion of, of how you're sampling the distribution of the events also can play for, let's say, uh, for insurance, for uh, meteorology, weather, and so forth. I wish I had known that earlier today. Um, 
So this is the range of things. There are a few other areas. Um, when you get into them, you start asking what algorithms are being used in each. For example, is this really an optimization algorithm that I'm using, a quantum optimization algorithm? And then you start thinking, well, maybe I don't want to just use this for chemistry. Maybe I want to use it for something else. So this is only just an idea. This is not an exhaustive list of what we might be doing. Quantum computers are not meant to completely replace classical computers anytime soon. I will tell you, we will all be long gone by the time there is a pure quantum computer that does everything they're supposed to do plus everything that a classical computer is supposed to do. Now, the theory says, well, in fact, you could run any classical algorithm through a quantum computer, and it would run glacially slow. All right? So the future is a hybrid of classical and quantum. Even in five or ten years, let's say quantum really pans out, and we can say in a particular application area, wow, this is significantly faster right here using quantum. If you look at the total solution, the total app, 95% of it's likely to be classical. It's just some special things that are going to be done. Uh, this is a, a very <laughs> kind of poor um, representation of some complexity classes, which if you're looking at theoretical computer science, uh, there are lots of things you have and they had all these sorts of things and the various things that start with B for quantums and so forth. Um, I, I'm obviously not going through the exact theory here, but there are some questions you can ask, which is just, is quantum really actually ever faster? So this brings us to something else um, with quantum. Please do not say, unless you've already done it, quantum computers will do this. Prove it. And the only way to prove that is to do it. Right? I, I mean, right? I mean, lots of things. You know, this research will cure cancer. Well, that's a noble thing to do. We shouldn't invest in that. But people have been saying that for 50 years. Right? And there's a tremendous amount of skepticism when people say, quantum computers will do this. My favorite is someone saying, quantum computer will fix climate change, <laughs> right? I mean, if you're going to go, go big, right? It's <laughs> things, you know? Um, and, and so you have to be careful about these sorts of things. And for those of you who are more entrepreneurial, and I know this is a broad group of, of people, um, there's no reason to believe that the percentage of successful quantum computer startups will be much larger than the percentage of successful startups. Okay? Good luck to you, really. We're rooting for you all. Okay? But nevertheless, 10%, <laughs> you know, is, is that number. But there, there are a number of things you can do. One of the worst things, though, that can happen to you in this space, because you're so focused, and right? it's quantum this and quantum that, is to set expectations so that we fail very quickly. So that is the trough of disillusionment, right, with Gartner, right? You know, you kind of go up there, oh, that's really interesting, but maybe it's not quite panning out. And boy, who told us to do this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> and many things die down there. And then slowly say, like, well, okay, maybe we'll figure out something useful to do with it. Right? This is where a lot of people die. And while the larger companies can survive, you know, let's say things cooled off on quantum for three to five years, you know, we're going to take on it, <laughs> right? It's going to be a lot harder to get funding and convince people you're really serious. So therefore, be very careful about inflating expectations about what you're doing. I try to do this. I try to act almost as a sheriff in this regard. So there is this question, um, both in terms of processing time as well as memory of what is hard, what is easy, classical versus quantum. When you talk about these things, so my own, my, my, my own example is, you realize how few people actually know about mathematical proofs and their significance. 
Now, I'm not saying they have to be able to prove a lot of things. But when you prove something mathematically, at least if you accept the axioms of what we're, what we're talking about, it's true. <laughs> it's not like it seems to be true. We looked at a bunch of stuff, and that's kind of the way it sort of is. There are a lot of statements in any area, right? So, so even when we go back uh, with Peter Shor, so Peter Shor's factoring algorithm, 1994, brilliant piece of work, right? Um, it said that at the time it was almost exponentially faster than any known classical algorithm. Okay, any known. <laughs> what if we know some new ones, right? What if we learn some new ones? So there's a difference between being able to prove something is faster, will always be faster, versus it seems to be faster given what we know now. And there have been several cases recently, uh, as I said, the MIT paper and something a little bit earlier, where people proved, in fact, you can do it classically. And the quantum algorithms are inspiring classical um, algorithm scientists you know, to rethink a lot of the things they did. So sometimes this gap shrinks. So when can you prove that a quantum computer is actually faster at doing that? Surprisingly rare, okay, and also surprisingly recently. And so this was a result that an IBM scientist, uh, Sergey Brave, with, with a couple of others, um, David Gossett, who was now here um, at the Institute, uh, proved that for a very particular type of example um, that they could, so-called short depth circuit, that they could show that the time you can increase the number of inputs, and the computation time would remain constant, but in the classical case, it would always increase logarithmically with the size of the inputs. Okay, so what this means is that even though we're talking logarithms, but we're not talking a big difference, this is a situation where we can finally separate these complexity classes that you can actually group. Right. And uh, it's got to be more than that. Uh, and, but this does go back to, you know, as I said, be very careful about the will stuff, because if someone comes along with a classical computer and does something, and this is true already for some things that have been out there for quite a while that are called quantum computing, that nevertheless are not particularly faster than what you can do possibly. And I'll let you figure out what I mean by that. So, we are in this quantum ready phase. Quantum foundations goes way back, quantum mechanics, I mentioned Peter Shore, uh, the work that's been done, the scientific work, but the foundations, the scientific foundation work will continue. All right, that goes on. Quantum ready means that nobody, and just to repeat my point, nobody today can prove that they can do something right, significant on a quantum computer versus a classical computer. I showed you that theoretical result, but in terms of actual solutions and because the machines aren't powerful. They have too few qubits, and the quality of the qubits is too small. I have a question related to this. Uh, in the news, they are saying that uh, NASA and Google have a quantum computer. Maybe there are some results that are not public. So, trust me, anybody <laughs> who has anything here is going to be blabbing it all over. Right? Repeat, repeat. So the question was, he had read in the news that Google and NASA were doing something. Uh, so, um, th there was a story last week or the week before about how um, Google is working with NASA uh, to uh, basically benchmark the Google quantum computers versus some of the NASA uh, supercomputers and also how this relates to quantum supremacy. So, quantum supremacy, and I will go on record, is a really stupid idea. Okay. <laughs> Quantum supremacy was introduced in early 2016. Well, the idea goes back further, but in particular, and, and, and look, all of these teams and all of the startups are filled with brilliant people, okay? So I'm not slagging on any of the scientific work, but I hope I try to give you impressions. Be careful of your PR. Be careful of what you say publicly. So, quantum supremacy was this particular test 
where you would say, ah, we will do this on our quantum computer. And you cannot do this on a classical computer. And therefore, the world is now divided between before quantum and after quantum. And right there, quantum supremacy happened. And oh, by the way, we are supreme, right, forever and ever in history and things like that. So there was this, you know, we'll do this quantum supremacy by the end of 2017 on a 49 qubit machine. And in September of 2017, um, I ran the math department. Several of my mathematicians proved and actually did run that test on a classical computer. Like, whoops, right? So you chose a bad case to do this. And frankly, we're still waiting for even that to run on a supposed 49 qubit machine that we understand fully and know all of the operating parameters and everything like that. So, um, so good luck to them. Okay, seriously, I wish them good luck, but if you're not publishing your stats, big deal. It's a mystery, right? Where are we supposed to think of it? Right? Okay, um, so-and-so is the best scientist in the world. He just won't publish. <laughs> right? I mean, great. All right, so quantum advantage, therefore, is this point in the future. You know, think of, instead of supremacy, as actually demonstrating in various areas, we can do a we have a significant advantage over what we know how to do classically. Now that may shrink over time as we learn to do things classically better, right? Or there may be mathematical proofs which support what we do and so forth. We think this period will be in the 2020s. We're hoping for in five years. And so different people 